Hello and welcome to another episode of Complimentary Cinema here on the O&M Stockroom. We're your hosts, Brian McGarry. And Ken O'Malley. And today's episode is about the 1984 high-tech drama action flick, The Runaway. Or maybe it's just Runaway. I think it's, yeah, just Runaway. It's just Runaway. So uh, what's your uh, first impression of this film? First impression was, I think it's well put together. As far as it looks pretty decent. It looks like an 80s movie, but it looks like one that's well made. Is that what you mean? Or you mean like poster, beginning, literally first impression? Literally first impression. Like, uh, did you like it or was it uh, was it crap? Um, I think I liked it. I think I liked it too. And it's funny because before we started watching this tonight... Those of you who have been with us for a little while, you know that uh, complimentary cinema always focuses on a free, uh, usually crappy movie that you can find on YouTube, and we will watch that and then uh, share it, our thoughts with you. And often we, we simply pick these films either based on the title or just whatever image they use to advertise it. And we go in, into these films knowing literally nothing else. Yeah, it's very rough. And it's very rough. And we were discussing... Uh, how nice it would be to finally watch a film that didn't suck and actually have something, uh, a, a film that we could say something good about. And I think we finally have one. Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, so I, I ended up picking this one. We, we take turns picking uh, which movies we're going to do. So Ken picks one, I pick one, so on and so forth. It was my turn this week. And uh, I'm like, okay, here's this cheesy looking Tom Selleck-ish uh character so let's uh yeah let's just do that 84 84 was a good year you know uh why not and um it turns out it actually was tom Selleck on the uh on the movie poster there and this film is uh written and directed by michael Crichton, who i think a lot of people will know as the writer of jurassic park and twister yes yep a lot of good books um a lot of movies made off of his books over the years so michael you know, Crichton's definitely a good uh, writer, and it definitely shows in this film. It's actually pretty well thought out. It's they built things reasonably well. It's not like one. It's not like a Jurassic Park kind of masterpiece, I would say, but it's definitely a competent film, and it's you know easy enough to follow. And unlike a lot of the films that we've been watching lately, there aren't any really disposable characters in this film. True. I, in fact, I think uh, maybe there's a couple characters that could have been used a little more that were underused. I think that was more sure. of a problem than having uh, unnecessary characters. Yeah, because I w- one of our uh, typical categories that we like to look for is a superfluous character. Who could you have cut out of this film that didn't need to be in it for the sake of the story? And there wasn't really anybody in this film that was extraneous. No. No, nobody was really wasted. Like I said, there's a few. I think uh, we could use a little bit more of the uh, the tech guy um, at the station, not his partner, but the other guy, Marvin, his um his his technical uh, companion. I think he could have gotten used a little bit more into the third act because he kind of fell off by the time you know other stuff was going on, and then obviously the son character was a little bit wasted. I think. Yeah. The, yeah. The the. So, so Tom Selleck in this film is a, he's a cop who basically chases down runaway tech. It's uh it's kind of like a near future kind of film. Not really, not truly sci-fi, not really like cyberpunk, but definitely futuristic high tech from the viewpoint of 1984. I will, it wasn't even necessarily like real futuristic. It was very believable as far as like the robots didn't look really futuristic. They looked kind of reasonable robots oh absolutely their capabilities were a little advanced for the time but they didn't look like futuristic i i think what really like let you know it was set in a time a little further down the road was just the involvement of all of these robots right like tom Selleck's character has a robot in the house that acts like a maid and mother to his kid Mm -hmm. makes dinner and answers the door and all that kind of thing make sure the kid brushes his teeth you know, having uh, robots and machines at construction sites that are automated. A lot of things like that. There's like video conferencing. They they have like an internet type of network. 
Uh, we see drones, which in this film are referred to as floaters. Yeah. And I thought it was funny because the first couple of times uh, they said floater, I'm like, I'm imagining it, a either the uh, the rock amazing rock band from Portland, Oregon, or B, I'm thinking about a body in a a dead body in a pool of water. Well, and especially because the first time we hear it is when they're at a crime scene where people have died. Like they're doing a crime scene investigation. And he's asking, where's the floater? And I'm like, there's no water around here. Yeah. He's in a suburban neighborhood. So anyway, they didn't have the word for drones yet, I guess. So it was a floater. It was a floater. It was, a little, it was a little world building, you know. A little, a little, you know. But yeah, and it was kind of nice. And it also, I also kind of liked that they called it a floater because it does kind of float in the air. But also, you don't necessarily know what he's going to say at first. Mm-hmm. Of course, I don't know that an audience member in 1984 would know. Right. What it, what would be meant by a floater, other than probably our same association? And they they use similar as far as all the robotics in the in the film. They all have kind of like uh, technical names or like uh, so you don't know until you see it. You don't really know what to expect to see it, like what it's going to look like. That's absolutely true. Like there's a um like in at the, at the first crime scene that he goes to, well like the well the first robot that he chases that's a runaway is a piece of errant farm equipment. Yeah. And then the next one is a gun wielding uh murderous uh automated machine that was in this uh family's home. And we find out later that it was they refer to it like basically as like a number, like an A2012 or something like that. And you know, that doesn't tell you anything. Just that it's a piece of machinery that is now apparently killing people. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And we f- find out later that this machine has been tampered with, with a special microchip. And uh, yeah, so there's a so there's a little bit of like high tech corporate uh, goings on. And the focus really isn't on, which I think is different than a lot of other sci fi I've seen. It isn't about that the robots are bad, or that they're corrupt, or like. You know, there's really, I mean, there's obviously like a, a a bad guy and his plans are bad, but the technology isn't portrayed in a in bad light at all. The technology is portrayed in, in a completely neutral light in a lot of ways, and I, I think that's funny because you see a lot of you see a lot of uh, examples of technology being used poorly and to the detriment of other humans. At the same time, right after that, Tom Selleck comes home and he's got this automated robot in his house that he's perfectly fine with yeah and it, it, it works well you know he, he they have kind of a little banter relationship you know he trusts it yeah. he, tr- he trusts this machine to take care of his son like immediately after fighting a machine that was murdering another family very true so that's a very interesting uh insight onto his character and how he views technology mm-hmm. and how they really are just tools and it's what you do with the tool that will decide if what happens is good or bad and they kind of talk too a little bit like okay i have the i have the better model it doesn't break down as much like his only concern is like okay i want to make sure it works right yeah not like that it's going to be a good or bad thing yeah just does it function the way it should and i, and I, I like that and i also at the beginning of this film too we were we were a little bit co- confused like why would the police department have a errant robot division but I mean, that kind of answers itself throughout the film as you see, like also like how these machines can be manipulated for worse and used in, in crimes and how sometimes when you have a runaway piece of technology, you don't know what is the cause of that. Yeah. You and- know, is it flipping a switch or is it actually going in and like discovering evidence of tampering and other malfeasance? Right. And I think that's really the, the core part of it is it's they're trying. It is like public safety. You know, that's really why it ends up being on them and not just like a, a technology company to hunt them down. Uh, all the all the times we see them being involved is because there's a safety issue. And in fact, in the one scene, they're on a construction site and uh, the lady running the site says, well, we don't use our own people because the insurance doesn't cover it. Like, Which was a, a really comical moment for both of us because that was the most, you know, if you're setting something in the future, I mean, does it get any better than that? Insurance will not cover errant robot. Yeah. Insurance it's wouldn't like, today. Of, of course it wouldn't. Of course it wouldn't. Yeah, so that was a that was a, that was a nice little touch there. And uh so some of these uh machines that are going errant, they have this little uh 
this fancy chip, which uh, was manufactured by Texas Instruments, has a little Texas Instrument logo on it, at least part of it. The other part of the chip has like a little red line on it to indicate that it's, you know, a, what do they call it? An arson special? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently this is something they've seen somehow before because they kind of know. Uh, it's like a self, it's like, a, it's like a self-destructive chip as well. Yes. When, when they, the, when the tech guy Marvin sees it and he sees that it's about to go off, he, mm-hmm. he knows instinctively to tell everyone to get down and, you know, there's a big explosion. It's an arson special. Yeah. So apparently this is like, you know, but probably the people used it on a smaller scale as far as like sabotaging like one specific thing. Whereas really the 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 point of it in this movie is that someone's trying to make like mass produce these things and just sell them to whoever will give them the money. And uh, the, the man behind that is a, is a man known as Dr. Luther, a, uh, a brilliant but uh, apparently malevolent engineer who was farmed out some of this research to some other colleagues. And uh, what I love about this particular character is that it's portrayed by Gene Simmons of the band Kiss. And uh, he's not the best actor by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, he was hired for this film based on just the cold dead look that he could give, which he does uh, quite a few glimpses of in this film. And it is effective. Like he looks like a guy who's got something behind his eyes and something that's not right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he, he, he he's, he's kind of a creepy guy. Yeah. He, the first time we see him is at that first crime scene and he's just kind of creeping in the background and, uh, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't do anything. He's just observing the scene and it is unsettling. He is a very unsettling, uh, un- very unsettling character. And I, I think that's, probably where his strengths as an actor are because every time he opens his mouth is when that illusion is affected a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I think maybe he just didn't know how to play it exactly. Like he knew the the expressions, you know, his face was always good and his mannerisms were pretty good and uh, just kind of physicality when he got into some action scenes. But uh, yeah, it, it, his voice acting didn't, it didn't, it it didn't quite match up with 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 what was going on with his face and everything else. Right. And it kind of reminded me of like that uncanny valley. Like uh like say with Tarkin and Rogue One, something doesn't quite something doesn't quite add up in just the right way. I kind of almost got the uncanny valley feeling looking at Gene Simmons in this film. Yeah. He just he didn't have like a menacing voice. And just the way that he said certain things, too, was just kind of funny. And I think part of that is just a product of the time. Because um, he's, he's chasing after some, let's just say, blueprints of this chip so we can mass produce it. And they call them photo templates. I, personally, I always hear people refer to them as templates. You know, but it was just certain certain emphasis on certain syllables and certain words combined with the way that he delivered the rest of his lines it was kind of funny mm-hmm. but still he was he was a fairly effective villain in this case and then uh tom Selleck is our hero of course and uh he's kind of a he's kind of a absentee father in in the life of his son which is uh portrayed by oh what's that kid's name son number one son number one joey kramer there we go so his son is uh, portrayed by Joey Kramer. Joey Kramer's other big claim to fame is that he's the uh, the lead in Flight of the Navigator, the Disney science fiction flick from 1986, which also has uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and Pee Wee Herman. And that's, uh, if anybody likes cheesy 80 sci-fi flicks, that's a fun one. So his kid in here, he's he basically is home all day with a robot named Lois who looks after him and tends to him is Tom Selleck, a workaholic cop seems to come home just enough to have like have a dinner at like 11 or 12 at night, kisses lonely son goodbye. And then he gets called back into the station. This seems to happen a couple of times. And we kind of wonder like, does the man sleep? Does the man eat? You know, when does he have time to trim his magnificently uh, mustached face? He certainly does not have a healthy work-life balance. 
Not at all. And I kind of feel bad for the kid, too, because like every time you see the kid, he's like, oh, I saw you on TV, Dad. Yeah, because the dad is always getting into these high-profile crime, or not even crimes, but just like the robots going awry. And so uh, he, he he's always on TV. And the news media is always showing up, and they're very invasive. Very. They're very invasive in their tactics. Very nosy and really throw safety and caution to the wind. The TV reporter goes in the house after Jack Ramsey, our main character, and he gets killed by this robot. So the news people are even getting killed going into these places. They really are. All, all just to get, get the late hot story. You know, it's a, it's a damning uh, appraisal of the news media. I, they don't even really get a good story. They, they really don't. They just get a dead cameraman. And you would think that their insurance wouldn't cover that. That's fair. Maybe it was in his contract. M- might have been, yeah. It's like, yeah, go follow the cop who's wearing chain mail and uh, hockey pads to go uh, get this uh, malfunctioning machine. So, wh- where the hell was I? So, we were talking about the main cast here. The main characters um, are all very solid. Uh, the other the other character we're introduced at the beginning is the new uh, the rookie cop. The new rookie cop in the runaway tech department. Yep. So she she has to try to keep up with uh, Tom Selleck's character because he's like always obviously a workaholic, like always on the move, always getting involved, and uh, so she's got to like learn the ropes real quick, very quickly. And uh, so her, that character is Thompson, and that's portrayed by Cynthia Rhodes, who wasn't in a whole lot else that I saw, but she did really really good in this, and it's kind of a shame that she quit acting not long after this film. But uh, she's a she's a very effective, a very effective sidekick for for him. Or part, I guess sidekick's a bad choice, but mm-hmm. she's a very effective partner with him because she can keep up with him. Uh, she can absolutely hold her own. You know, she's good in a gunfight. You know, she can take her licks and keep keep going. And she doesn't. Uh, she's not like a damsel in distress in this film, which I really like. She's she's a solid, strong lady female character and it's kind of like a joke too or not joke but a recurring theme too that she's like done a whole bunch of things and like this is finally like her like this is going to be her career now like you know she was like uh she wanted to be a computer programmer she She, wanted to be a dancer she wanted to be a dancer she's got all these things that she's had experience with and that kind of plays in your character being competent in a lot of things and well-rounded yeah very well-rounded as where Tom Selleck's uh, Jack Ramsey character, he's very, uh, very single-minded and, and very just narrowed in on on technology and aspects relating to that. And also just always going in head on, like not necessarily guns blazing, but like always just like straight to the problem without a whole lot of like pre-work or pre-thought. Yeah, it's like uh, like one of the first calls he gets, or I think even the first call, it's like, oh, hey, you know, you got to run away here. And he's like, get the chopper. Without even knowing what's going on, it's like, we're going to get the chopper, we're going to get on site and deal with it. Yeah. So, I mean, he's very gung-ho. He's very gung-ho on that. And we find out early in the film, too, that uh, Tom Selleck has vertigo. Can't handle heights very well. So the chopper ride's a bit of a busy, you know, a, is a bit of a bad mess for him. Uh, another call that they get, they go to a construction site and he he hands things off to his new rookie partner who just takes care of it just fine while he's uh kind of just hanging out there on the, on the ground like a pansy, you know? Mm-hmm. But they don't, you know, but nobody shames his vertigo or anything. Nobody calls him a coward or anything. Mm-mm, no. It's just, you know, an aspect of him. And, uh, well, the, it, it turns out that Part of the, like the way he is, the way he is, is because his vertigo made it so a criminal got away at some point, and he felt bad because that criminal ended up killing a bunch of other people. So you know, part of his character is like, eventually he needs to get over this, you know, to to be a better cop. Yeah, and to be a a more fully realized person too, to face his fears and overcome them, you know. So like, kind of funny because like the film Runaway. You know, yeah, it talks about like runaway tech, but it's also about running away from your problems a little bit, which he tries to do by staying busy in Damn. these other aspects of his life. Very true. You, you know, could like say 
he's running away from being romantic too, you know, because he's got this robot at home, so it's like completely out of his life. Uh, yeah. You know, his wife's dead, so he he he, uh, he he's just put it out of his life. He doesn't have to deal with it, you know. So it's another thing he's just running away from. You could even argue running away from his son, as far as not being that much involved in his life. Oh, absolutely, and you know his new partner. You know, she she uh, they talk about having dinner, and she's clearly romantically interested in him uh, very quickly. And uh, he really just tries to keep it professional and cool and distant, which, let's be fair, in a work environment with your colleagues, it would it would behoove him to, you know, keep it professional, at least after, I mean, they've only known each other for a couple of days here. I think typically partners in a, in a police setting would have more relaxed relationship so i wouldn't say it's out of the out of the question you know what i mean but it it is definitely i mean from our perspective yeah you, you would probably want to keep that a little distant not something you'd want to dive headlong into like he does everything else true but they really make it you know they really he puts put, up too big of a barrier there he, he does put up an awfully large barrier there which is too bad because his partner is adorable so let's see so they uh so they go on another call when they're when they're investigating the these chips and the call ends up being in the same building, and uh, finally we see Kirsty Alley. It's funny she's got like third billing in this on, in the title, and like f- we don't see her until like forty minutes into the film, and I personally completely forgot that she was even in this thing, and when she showed up, it's like, holy shit, it's Kirsty Alley, from Cheers, Star Trek Two, The Wrath of Khan, look who's talking. And uh, presumably other films and television shows. And at that point, too, I wondered, you know, before we saw her, I wondered if she was only going to be like a very small part and just, you know, use her just to get her name on the on the credits. But uh, it just took a while to get to her, you know. Yeah, it did. And I kind of wonder if part of that had to do with her being involved in Cheers. I didn't I don't recall what year she started on Cheers. But it had to have been right around that time, 1984. I probably should have spent more than like two and a half minutes online looking some things up before this. But that's that's how we roll in this. Is it really important, show. though? We I, can just speculate I, wildly. I, I, I do kind of speculate wildly because it's that was a huge show. And that's a very time, you know, working on a sitcom is a very time consuming commitment. So that certainly would have limited uh, how much time and effort she could have put into a feature film. I mean, narratively, it made sense. You know, we didn't need to meet her any any sooner, so it's not like they shoehorned her in. We'd already seen the bad guy at the first crime scene uh, looking menacing. And so this was just introducing another character uh, that's involved in this company that's making the chips. That's also involved with Dr. Luther. Right. Because that's the menacing bad guy. The menacing bad guy. Yes, I missed that part. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we'll just we'll, screw, we'll pretend to move on. Computers. Computers. So, so, anyway. uh, so, so, so some of the some of the interesting tech that that I really liked in this film was uh, Gene Simmons' fancy little gun. He basically has a gun full of heat sinking missile bullets, which I thought was pretty bitchin'. And I really liked the uh, you get you get like a kind of like almost like a fish eyes lens view of of the bullet as it's chasing people around. And then it just kind of just smacks them right in the back and lots of sparks and everything. It's, you know, kind of fun. It's like, why don't we have that now? Because we would be in so much, so much trouble if we had bullets that could heat sink to a person's individual body heat pattern. Yeah. I'd also really, so which is how they supposedly track people. Every, every person has their own body heat pattern. How much truth is there to that? I would guess none, because as soon as you add or remove clothing, your heat signature is immediately going to change. Yeah, but what about weight and height and age and level of activity? I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess you're right, because even, no matter what, your body your body heat signature would fluctuate. Yeah, it's going to change all the time. And I guess, And I guess the other part, too, is how would you get somebody's body heat signature in the first place? And uh, they it, it, they don't explain it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be programmed for one person's body heat. It can be in a mode where it's just body heat because he ends up shooting just like random cops and stuff too. 
around corner. He does in that he does in that scene, yeah. So it, it, it I'm assuming they didn't explain it, but I'm assuming there's a mode where it just heat seeks, and then there's a mode where it heat seeks a specific heat. That's my guess. I'm just wondering. Sure, which makes sense. I just wonder how would you program that to begin with, because the first time we see that gun, those bullets have no problem flying by other people. Yeah, and going right to their target. I just assumed it was a mode thing. He had just programmed certain ones to do that. Sure. I just want to know how to pick <laughs> one person. Very carefully. I guess. I guess that's why we don't have them yet. Yeah. So the exploding chips and the the seeking missile bullets are the main uh, force behind this bad guy. Uh, he wants to have the technology. He wants to be able to make it, but he doesn't want anyone else to be involved. He doesn't want anyone else to know how to do it or that he's doing it. So the whole time he is trying to get the technology just for himself, and he's also trying to eliminate everyone else that helped him along the way. Which you know, which makes absolutely perfect sense, especially for something as dangerous and as lucrative as what he's trying to do. The problem with that tactic, though, in this film, is that he kills somebody in public. Very obviously, with what a hundred witnesses, which is very very sloppy work on his part. If he's trying to like reduce witnesses and and evidence. It, it's also the same scene where they're just firing guns in a crowd. So it is. And you would think that if you were really, you know, even if your blood is up and, and you're pissed and like you want to get back at Tom Selleck and his mustache, I would still assume that you'd want to do that in a, in a more secluded and more private way so that you don't reveal to half the town that you like literally are just murdering and, and killing people. This was the other thing that stood out to me in this scene that uh, I thought was kind of funny. So he falls over a waterfall intentionally into the water below, right? And then he gets out of the waterfall, the, the, the pond, and runs away and hides behind some trees nearby. And then assu- and we assume he just leaves from there. He gets away. Now, if he was in the water and he came out of the water, it would leave wet footprints all over the pavement, right where he was. I would assume. So that that was one thing I was just like, wait a second. He would leave water everywhere. He was soaking wet. But that's another thing. Like He was in public, and he wasn't necessarily acting sneaky. He wasn't acting very smart. Um, he just was trying to get what he wanted and get out. Which I can relate to sometimes. Sometimes you just want to get in and get out. Sometimes you want to fire homing bullets. In public... In a in a uh, fancy dining area. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Just 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 a bad look for him. Just to you know, I just I just wish that th- that's one part of this film that I wish they had spent a little more time writing. I think it's just his character was menacing and then kind of just overtly not evil but just like selfish and that's really. It it wasn't a sure, re- but really complex character. But in all the other scenes where we see him, he tries to be discreet. He tries to be discreet. Like we see him, we see him like on that little video answering machine, where he he shows up and he, he's in disguise. Okay, the, we see him being discreet at the first crime scene. We see see him try to discreetly eliminate one of his uh one of his associates. Then that's where it breaks down. That's where it breaks down. And it's just, we establish a pattern of discretion and of being coy. And then at that dinner scene, they just really throw that out the window. And he comes out just into the open to basically commit murder and continue his nefarious acts. Yet later in the film, at the, uh, at the, the scene of the climax is a deserted area. And again, he's back in, you know, being secretive and and discreet. Like he even sneaks into the police station at one point, you know, in, in a police uniform and everything. So it basically begs the question. Like, do you see how like that one scene is a huge, huge, huge fucking anomaly? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Why would you pick that place? He doesn't have any reason to go in public. None. 
uh, other than impatience. We and ha- I, I would think that he would be more patient than that. And most of the times we had the action scenes in public before that, he wasn't involved. It was, you know, they had the homing bullets, you had the ho- the drone, whatever you want to call them, the dr- car drone things. The, yeah, car drone. Little vehicle drones. L- yeah, little like road road worthy explosive drones. So, but all those things, he was just behind the scenes, you know. So I guess that is right. It's just that at that point. It's that one scene, like two thirds of the way of the movie where he basically just reveals himself to everyone around him. And but it they, just, but uh, they don't know what's going on. It's just, they don't know what's going on, but I mean, it's, it's his face. True. You know, everyone can hear him and see him. True. It would be you hard know? to get away. It would be incredibly hard to get away. Cause really the only thing is that he keeps getting leverage. So he gets the sun, you know what I'm saying? Like he, he, he keeps doing what he can to get leverage. He's not really that, um, like, I don't know what his end game is after all of that. He's just trying to get those photo templates. Yeah. And I so guess he can continue mass production of these uh, these special microchips. I mean, I guess he would be fleeing the country. I would assume, but not necessarily. You know, like so, like you know, let's say this is so you know, film you know, filmed in eighty four takes place a few years later, so like early nineties. You know, you know, the United States is a pretty nice place. Uh, you know, thirty some odd years ago. You know, Europe, you know, there's Interpol, there's international police, there's the international criminal court in the Hague. I mean, he's going to sell explosive to terrorists and stuff. That's not exactly like... That's what I'm saying. So it's like, you know, there's really nowhere he can... I mean, it doesn't make sense for him to flee to anywhere outside of the country because the long arm of the law, you know, if he was not careful, would find him wherever he is. Yeah. Presumably. So what would you say is the uh, the best performance in this film so far? I would say I mean I, I I and it's funny that I said so far I meant in the film period because the film is over. Yes. We have watched the film. We have concluded the film. We concluded the film some time ago. <laughs> so what would you say is the best performance? Well, in the here? best character since the film has has concluded. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would say the main character. I, I enjoyed him. Uh his face and, Tom Selleck. Yeah, I did enjoy his uh, his, his that character. Huh? No, okay. I'm gonna take it all back. You're gonna take it all back. I like the sidekick lady. She's pretty awesome, isn't she? I think she was my favorite. She did good, man. She she was very emotive. She was very sympathetic. She her whole her role would have been a complete ten out of ten if we hadn't gotten to the fluffy hair. That that is true. We we did get to a point where she was in. She was like in hot cop babe mode, and then she went into 80s poodle hair. Complete, like with the uh, the white shoulder pad, uh, shoulder pad blazer. But the character was still fine. But the character was still great. But it definitely, it it, it, it it put that down. Appearance did take down a notch or two, but that's okay. We, can, like, we can look past that. Especially like when she uh, when she was she was injured and in that scene. I mean, she did a great job uh, during that and just being the character that's, you know, learning along with us. I think that was sure was good. She did not have quite the the, uh, the full arc necessarily of a of a fully well written realized character. She she basically shows up. She learns a little bit. She grows a little bit, but she never really she never really becomes truly transformed in this film. So, like uh, from certainly from a writing perspective, I do think that you know Tom Selleck's character would be the best in that regard. Yeah. Uh, acting wise, I've not, it, it's funny because watching this, I never, I, I was kind of thinking about how I never really watch him in anything. Mm-hmm. You know, like I saw Magnum PI as a kid a long, long time ago, but only just a you know handful of episodes. I saw him on an episode of friends at one time, I think. I mean, that's an old distant memory from high school. I there's just not a whole lot I can point to that have been like, oh yeah, I love Tom Selleck. He was in this, this, and this. So this is like one of the first times I've ever like have consciously watched one of his performances. And I do think he did great. I think honestly that the acting was all good. Um I like the police chief. He was good. G. W. Bailey from uh Police Academy. Yeah. Um, the uh basically the the jerk that no one likes. 
Yeah, he was he was the police chief in this. And it's funny because he, he played like the angry police chief that Tom Selleck kept putting in check over and over and over. But no, he was, you know, but that was a, he was a good little character. I really liked, uh, again, we liked Marvin, Tom Selleck's uh, tech cop associate. I think he could have done more towards the end of the film. Yeah, it, it. we never see him outside of the police station, unfortunately. Like it would have been They needed to have cool. the scene where Tom Selleck needed to call in to get the important information, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Of how to defeat, you know, whatever. How to defeat these, like, uh, alien-esque... Creepy spider creepy robots. Creepy, hand-crawly spider robots. Yeah, he, he did seem a little underutilized, for sure, in that regard. It's It's just too bad that they didn't get him out of the office, so to speak. Yeah. He's just st- stuck in the office doing tech stuff, which, you know, was fun. Yeah. But would have been nice to see him out of there. And then there was, uh, oh, man, who else was well, in Christy this Christy Alley, thing? obviously. Christy Alley. She was the, uh, the, the girlfriend of the, the villain. Of the villain, of Gene Simmons. That's kind of an odd pair. And then all the other, you know, just uh, small character roles. I think everyone did a great job, you know. It stood out because we've had, this has been the first time where that has been the case. I couldn't point to anyone and say that was weak or then that was bad. Um, All of them were, were their characters, you know, were believable. There's definitely not a, there's definitely not a bad performance in this film, I think. Yeah. Maybe the news, uh, the new, the newscaster lady. But see, she was great at being a terrible person. She was great at being irritating. I was just thinking if there's one character I would have liked to have gotten rid of, it would have been that one. <laughs> See, if she would have gotten shot in the crossfire, that would have been great. That wouldn't I wouldn't have been upset about that. It, wouldn't that have been funny if she had shown up at the last scene at the construction site <laughs> and then like something <laughs> dropped on her? The public has a right to know what's going on. <laughs> Here, get on this elevator and get kicked the fuck off. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, another, or another category we like to talk about, uh, soundtrack slash score. So in this case, it was uh, produced by uh, Jerry Goldsmith. He was done just all all kinds of stuff. He did uh, a lot of the Star Trek themes, just a bunch of random movies. I, I can't name much else off the top of my head, but he's one of those guys that you have heard him do many different scores all over the you know the last 30, 40 years. And this was apparently one of his only and first uh, fully electronic scores. Uh, it's very, you know, synthesizer based. And I think we can agree that the music in this film fell flat. It was, yeah, there was, it was some, a couple times where like, even in the beginning, I was like, oh, here comes the synths. Like, you know, right off the bat, it was very, um, you know, not futuristic, but it is computer generated music. So that's kind of like a futuristic thing. And I love computer generated music, but he's no like Brad Fidel, you know, he didn't have like that Terminator gravitas of like really great you know synth lines it was just kind of there was a couple times where it was decent in the backgrounds like before and during a couple action scenes but the stuff in between didn't necessarily match very well it was like almost frilly yeah it 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 didn't have um it didn't convey the seriousness of what was going on very well it didn't complement that very well and the uh the ending credit music was probably the worst uh so spoiler alert You know, Tom Selleck and his new partner are making out at the end. And there's sparks flying from the ceiling, kind of almost out of nowhere. And for like the next few minutes, you just see them basically just make out with sparks filling up like two thirds of the screen. A very comical way to end this film, I might add. And 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 the music completely ruins the mood of everything that just came before. It was completely out of place. And and he does mean minutes. It was literally I mean, minutes. It, it went on and on. Like, like we, it was like maybe three minutes into it, four minutes. And then finally they get to the, they start scrolling the actual cast and it fades to black. And then the music changed very abruptly to a piece of music they used earlier in the film. Yeah. So sloppy in that regard. I do think that, uh, like I said, some of the, the synth stuff when there was action scenes and um, little tension areas. Uh, it was pretty decent, but it didn't stand out, um, even the stuff that was all right. Yeah, this is definitely not Jerry Goldsmith's best work by far. It's probably in the, the definitely like the bottom rung. I mean, this was probably, a, you know, for him, a learning, learning curve, too. 
Yeah, it definitely would have been earlier in his career as well. Yeah. So uh, what would you say your uh, final score and recommendation would be on this, Ken? I would say this is probably one of those more overlooked movies that I think is actually pretty decent. You know, I think um, I enjoyed watching it. I enjoyed the concept of it. And um, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but uh, it kept me entertained all the way through uh, from beginning to end. Uh, there was a couple moments near the end where I was like, this has slowed down a little bit too much. But overall, I thought it was good. I'm going to have to agree with that. I, I definitely would recommend this for anybody who likes tech-oriented or science fiction-oriented films. Because it, it doesn't necessarily beat you over the head with any of those things. They very just subtly work it in. And it's only it's only because it's out. it's, it's all stuff that we do today. And it's mostly stuff that we have today. And it only feels like a more science fiction based movie because of the time it was set in, you know, but even, even so all of that technology still technically existed then as well. It just wasn't prevalent. And I think that's kind of a nice, uh, it feels like almost like an alternate 1984. Mm -hmm. Like what, what, what could have been if we had been just, you know, five, 10 years more advanced with some of our technology, what would the world possibly have looked like? And, and just with people being more focused on it. I think that's a big difference between this universe, whatever you want to call it, this movie's universe, is that people are just more willing to be integrated with it than people were at that time. Absolutely. And, and I think it, it ties in with a, a recurring theme of Michael Crichton of examining, you know, examining technology and its effect on society and what some of the repercussions are of that. Because, you know, certainly you see some of the, you know, some of the consequences of using this technology poorly, but at the same time, you see some of the benefits of how it can be used well. So it's uh, like the film itself. I think that's a very balanced thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I enjoy that it's as much as I do enjoy also bleak futuristic movies. I enjoy that. And like, you know, maybe where the the robots have gone awry in a bad way or, you know, those are definitely enjoyable movies. But this was enjoyable because the technology was treated, like you said earlier, in a neutral way. And it was, you know, someone bad used it for bad. Good people used it for good. And almost everyone used it neutrally for neutral. Like, just it's just a thing that you do use in life, you know. And so that, I think, rang a lot more true and uh, made it just an enjoyable film to watch. Yeah, it really was, you know. So, I mean, if you're a fan of Tom Selleck, definitely you, you're going to want to check this one out. If you're a fan of Michael Crichton's work. This is definitely one to check out. Um, if you just want to see some like, you know, gorgeous 80s babes, definitely a, a fun film, you know. And if you're a fan of Kiss, why not check out one of Gene Simmons only film roles? I mean, he did like four or five. This was uh, the first of them. So check him out. Uh, any other uh, final thoughts or, or comments on this one before we move on, Ken? Um, I did also comments at some point in the middle. That uh, I guess it is a PG-13 film. It is a PG-13 film. But it could have easily been a PG film, I think, with a few changes. So it's not... Um, there is there is some brief nudity and a little bit of strong language, but nothing uh, nothing that would s frighten or scar your children for life. Right. Yep. Except maybe Jim uh, Gene Simmons' hair. <laughs> That's enough to scar me for a minute. Yeah. Yep. I, I really enjoyed it. I, that's all I can really say, I guess. All right. So yeah, definitely a, a thumbs up from us uh, on this one. Run, run away from 1984. So uh, that's it for this week's episode of Complimentary Cinema. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, here at the O&M Stockroom. And we'll see you all next week with hopefully a uh, good movie.